Hey remote learners, how are you today? So this video won't actually be that long today because I think I was mentioning that uh, the lecture from last Thursday, Friday, I kind of did the Rockefeller lecture for you guys all in one uh, session, which is how I would have liked for it to have gone in person, but it took a lot longer to revise the Carnegie writing assignment and to work on it in class than I had first thought. So uh, you guys had been kind of ahead in the lecture and I let the kids in class kind of catch up today so this one won't be that long. So we've already talked thus far about some of the major, you know, captains of industry, robber barons, whatever you want to call them, wealthy tycoons of the second industrial revolution, the Gilded Age. And remember, we've talked about Vanderbilt. And at this point, you should start to kind of classify them in your mind because our test is, oh, not this week, but at the end of next week. So we're, you know, more than halfway through the chapter, maybe, I don't know, 70% at this point. So Vanderbilt, remember, makes his money through the railroad industry, him and Jay Gould. And Carnegie makes his money through steel. Rockefeller makes his money through oil. And we kind of went through last time and we talked about how much money these men had in comparison to the wealthiest people in the world today. And it's just ridiculous to think about how much money these people would have had. They would have still blown away the competition by today's standards uh, if we take inflation into account. So it really kind of makes one think. Perhaps they really were robber barons. You know, they really were focused on their own greed. They took advantage of the capitalist system and the lack of government involvement, and they, they didn't really care for their workers. Uh, but there is, of course, evidence that they cared about, you know, the average man, and they participated in philanthropy, and they gave back to charity. Now, our last lecture kind of for Section 3 today is going to talk about our last of our industrialists, so we're going to be moving to J.P. Morgan. And if Rockefeller is oil and Carnegie is steel and Vanderbilt and Jay Gould are railroads, when we think about J.P. Morgan, I want you to think about J.P. Morgan as a man who made his money through banking and through stocks. So that slide that we just did, you know, this is the same one from last class and there was nothing you really needed to write down on it. It's not like you're going to have to memorize uh, the net worth of Mark Zuckerberg. Okay, so the man that you're seeing in the picture here, this is J.P. Morgan. And as I said, what you really want to remember about him is that he made his money through banking and through the stock market. And J.P. Morgan is very different compared to someone like Andrew Carnegie. And when it comes to Carnegie, you know, he was a poor man who grew up in Scotland and came to America when he was 12 and took any job he could get. And he was hardworking and determined and really embodied the American dream because, you know, he was desperate to make money, to have a successful business, to make a name for himself. But he was incredibly poor, which is perhaps why he gave back money later in life, because he bought into the gospel of wealth and he felt like it was the duty of the rich to help the poor. Now, J.P. Morgan, or John Pierpoint Morgan, um, did not grow up poor. He came from a pretty wealthy family and he had a lot of business connections. Unlike other men of his day, he was able to attend high school, to attend like some type of college class, a business school, um, had some knowledge of the law and of banking. He was able to secure a job in a bank and had a lot of connections because of family, friends, and his father's wealth. And, you know, as he worked in banking, uh, he was paid well, plus he had his own kind of private, you know, money from his family. And he was able to use his influence uh, and his connections to help kind of uh, make mergers occur. So remember we talked last time about how um, Carnegie obviously, you know, participate in a lot of vertical integration where one company takes over other companies that they need to gain those supplies, those goods, those products so that they can save money in the long run. That's my Rice Krispie example. Compared to Rockefeller who bought out companies that produced the same product as him so that there was less competition. You know, J.P. Morgan working at a bank um, was almost like a car salesman. You know, he was willing to do anything to get the deal made, to um, make the merger happen. So working with lawyers, working with heads of companies, friends with the people because of his family, friends and connections, uh, was able to bring, you know, um, a commission for himself, kind of like a car salesman would, um, some added income plus his regular salary. And of course, the bank would love to make the merger happen so that they could perhaps secure a loan. Uh, and that would mean, you know, people would have to pay back that loan as well as interest. So he made, you know, lots of money on some of these merger deals and working for the bank and gaining interest and just already had some of his own private funding. Now, he also makes money because he just starts to, you know, invest in the stock market. And the average American, you have to understand, 
you had no real interest in paying the stock market at this point. You couldn't play the stock market because you didn't have any money. Um, you know, average income during this time period, the estimates vary, but I've seen numbers anywhere from about $390 a year to maybe $450 or $500 a year was an average salary, meaning that most Americans were poor and lived below poverty line, especially immigrants, compared to there we were seeing somewhat of a, a rising middle class as people were managers in factories or as perhaps women worked in secretarial jobs, those pink professions in the very gender biased world. Maybe they'd make seven, eight hundred dollars uh, a year into average uh, annual income. Maybe even up to a thousand dollars a year, or twelve hundred. Maybe if they were upper middle class, but you know that's nothing in comparison to what some of these wealthy people have, and they've had money for generations. They're what we refer to as old money, so to speak. People who've had money for years and years through banking, investments, farming, and you know it's easier when you're you're born money to play the stock market the average american is not going to waste their hard money earn money on basically a gamble and he's able to play the stock market he has connections he knows which companies are doing well which they're succeeding and as he buys and sells stock he's focused on profit and he's able to make a profit and he uses that money that he's basically gotten through you know working at the bank from helping mergers occur from his own private you know family money and from playing the stock market to start becoming more and more interested in the railroad business. And he basically becomes a railroad tycoon. At this point in time, you know, Vanderbilt is dead and Jay Gould, uh, remember we talked about him, he is the big railroad tycoon in the East. Um, he was definitely a ghoul or a robber baron. You know, he had taken over about 15,000 tracks um, throughout America, this Jay Gould. And, you know, he was accused of uh, all sorts of bribery and corruption, basically what we call graft. Um, you know, there were charges that he had paid off members of President Grant's cabinet um, so that he could, you know, create investments in the railroad and make money and make a profit where everyone else was failing, that he was trying to corner the gold market, that he led to an economic depression. So Gould was a pretty nasty character. And reports basically claim that Jay Gould uh, basically it's outwitted, outsmarted by J.P. Morgan, and J.P. Morgan is able to buy out some companies from under him, uh, companies that were struggling. And so J.P. Morgan, even though we think of him as someone who makes his money through banking and through the stock market, he does also kind of act like, you know, Vanderbilt and Gould because he gets interested in the railroad industry and he wants to become this tycoon and he starts buying out companies with his money, which are financially struggling. And, you know, ultimately, yeah, he starts really and truly participating in horizontal integration. So he starts acting like Rockefeller. He never really gets into the oil business, but you know Rockefeller was all about horizontal integration. Buy out companies which are struggling economically. They're going to be willing to sell. They want to have some money when it's all said and done. They need to pay back their loans. They don't want their employees to be out of a job. So he buys up these struggling companies and he merges them with his other railroad companies until he gets... Uh, more of a railroad empire. And he is considered a railroad magnate or tycoon. He ends up controlling about 5,000 miles of track uh, of American railroads. He's willing to offer um, shipping discounts, so basically cheaper rates if you want to ship your goods on his railroad trains. Uh, he's willing to charge lower fares. So he's willing to, you know, be innovative and use technology, but he's not willing to pay the employees more. Oh, no. When he takes over these railroad companies, he's focused on profit. He looks at it more as, well, these companies were struggling. I'm going to make them work harder. I'm going to give them less of a break. I want to make a profit. I want to make money. And so he is not focused on treating the workers better in any way, shape, or form. You know, they're still working 12 hours a day, six days a week with low pay. There's no minimum wage at this point. So he's a complex man, to say the least, considering he made his money through banking, the stock market, uh, gets involved in the railroad industry just like um, Vanderbilt and Gould, and then acts like Rockefeller when he participates in horizontal integration to take out the competition. Now, the other thing is, he is quite an intelligent man because he thinks to himself, well, if I'm going to be taking over these railroad companies and I'm going to be building more railroad trucks across the nation to connect my railroad lines and to take out the competition, what do you need for railroads? Well, you need steel. And so he decides to participate in some vertical integration uh, and he decides to buy U.S. Steel. He makes an offer to Andrew Carnegie, not entirely sure the man will accept, sends a messenger over, Carnegie scribbles down a number on a piece of paper, 
never thinking that J.P. Morgan would be willing to pay such a high price. Morgan says, fine. He pays it. Carnegie retires, spends time with his wife and child. This is really when Carnegie gets into um, the gospel of wealth, the idea that even though God perhaps chose him to be wealthy, he will do his duty to society and to help the poor. And J.P. Morgan is now the owner of a steel corporation. And so, you know, he is becoming wealthier and wealthier. And on the last slide, you know, we saw this political cartoon from the perspective of the political cartoonist, it definitely seemed like he was a monster and he was involved in these million or billion dollar mergers and he was going to be attacking children and adults alike. And he had his hand and control basically on everything, which is kind of true. I mean, he's controlling the railroads, he's controlling steel, he's controlling the banks, he's controlling the stock market, all these different things. And you can see yet again in the political cartoon below, the man in the picture is JP Morgan. It may be hard to see, it does say Morgan on his hat, and Morgan was often shown smoking a pipe. Um, you can see they have like an exaggerated nose. And the man next to him is supposed to be Uncle Sam. And Uncle Sam is always characterized, you know, in that manner as an older gentleman and, you know, always wearing some kind of flag outfit. But look at him. He looks almost like sick or tired or like a child. Uh, look how much smaller he is compared to J.P. Morgan. So... There's definitely a message here about how America's barely holding on, America's just a child, America's being controlled perhaps by J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan is at the helm, the wheel, the leader of the boat. Um, he's in charge. And it definitely was true, at least it looked that way for quite a while as he was raking in the money at really the expense of the average American. He also goes on to create the House of Morgan, which helps to um, merge deals between some of these major companies. Uh, and it helps people to buy and sell stock because that was a lot more difficult than it is today. It's not like you can just, today you go on etrade.com and you buy and sell stock on your own. Back then you would need a stockbreaker, and if you didn't have a phone, you'd have to write a letter, and you know all the trades were made in person, so it was more complicated. We also know that he helps um, ease America out of the economic panic or smaller depression or unemployment was high in 1907, um, you know, giving money to companies and showing the banks are secure. And is he still around today? Yes. Uh, J.P. Morgan, obviously, he's dead, um, but his business is still around. You know, towards the end of his life, he did give money to philanthropic efforts, to art institutes, and to schools, and to hospitals, and things like that. But most of the money went on to his children. And you've probably heard of, like, Chase Credit Card um, and, like, Chase Visa and things like that. Well, credit cards don't come out until the 1920s, um, you know, and into the 1930s. But J.P. Morgan Chase is a major bank powerhouse in America today and gives out loans to people and, you know, credit cards and things like that. And so, yeah, it's definitely still around today. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, why, oh, why, oh, why has the government not done anything during this whole time period to help the average American? Well, remember, it's because in America we have a capitalist economic system, which is focused on private property and profit and the government not getting involved because of that French term of laissez-faire or let it be. And this belief, as first articulated by Adam Smith, that, you know, consumers, you know, should just let businessmen do business and it would mean cheaper profits for them and higher profits for the business owner. And so that's why the government really never got involved to stop the creation of these horizontal and uh, vertical mergers. And it, it allowed the integration. These mergers create trusts, and trusts, you know, are monopolies. And monopolies are when one business pretty much controls, um, you know, a good or a portion of the economy. There's no free trade, and they're bad for the average American. They're great for robber barons. Rockefeller was reaping in the money. Uh, but the average American is they're buying up oil to heat their kerosene lamps or for, um, you know, to power their machinery and their transportation equipment. They have to pay ridiculously high prices, and they can't afford it. And part of the reason why, you know, there were, there were not anti-merger and anti-monopoly laws earlier in history is because of graft, is because of corruption, is because Rockefeller was trying to pay off some of the congressmen to gain their support. And although uh, journalists like Ida Tarbell tried to expose it, uh, working as a muckraker, someone who exposes the filth of corruption of society, no change came. But eventually, uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act is passed. And so Sherman was one of the congressmen anti means against. A trust is another word for like a board of trustees or a monopoly. So this is basically Sherman's against monopoly law. And it basically said monopolies are bad. We should make them illegal. Um, there's no more trusts. Uh, they interfere with free trade. They're bad for the consumer because they mean higher prices. They're great for the robber baron. 
Now this law passes, and I showed you a chart last week which really showed that for a while there in the Gilded Age there were tons of monopolies and mergers happening, and then eventually they kind of drop off. Basically, what this law does, it kind of stops new mergers from happening, but it doesn't really do a lot from breaking up old monopolies. And because Rockefeller and Carnegie and some of these men had fantastic lawyers, um, they can find loopholes to avoid breaking up the monopolies, and they even can find ways to still make mergers happen and for them to still make money. So for the most part, the trusts remain intact. All right, guys, that's it for now. Uh, you'll see another po lecture posted here a little bit later tonight that goes along with the exit slip um, that you'll be doing uh, that goes with it about labor unions in Section 4. Have a great day, guys. I'm hoping that you learned a little bit more about J.P. Morgan, how he got his money, and you've come to a conclusion about whether you think he's a robber baron or a hero. That's it for now.